We're going to finish up this morning what we started on Friday night, three services yesterday, the Everlasting Covenant. And I pray as I prepared myself last night to come here today that in some way this is something that will attach itself under your hearts and your minds to the place that you'll go home and study it. There is no reason in the world, as I said when we started on Friday night, uh, this isn't for the faint of heart. This isn't for the doubting Thomases. This is for Ephraim. And I want to explain one more time how you know who Ephraim is. Ephraim isn't arguing. Ephraim is saying, I'm coming home. Okay? Everything else, not Ephraim. I realize there are just some people that's got some things in their hearts they need delivered from, and it's called an argumentative spirit, or want to show you how you're wrong because they're so smart. And as I told you, the, 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 the culprit of all this was the charismatic movement, because somehow we in that movement got you believing that you could learn the Word of God and you could know as much as the ministry knows, and if that was the case, there wouldn't be a fivefold ministry at all. And it's not the case. You know, we went, we went from one end of the gauntlet to the other end. We, uh, uh, centuries ago, uh, people didn't have Bibles in the church. In fact, they were told, don't worry about you trying to understand what it says. We'll tell you. Boy, that was a mistake. We went from that end to the charismatic movement saying, you just read it and ask the Lord by the Holy Ghost to tell you what it is. Don't worry about it. It'll be God. Didn't make either end of it right, did it? But God brings the balance. Let's go to Ezekiel, 20th chapter. And we'll start there. Got a few verses I want to uh, share with you here. So you, you, you understand, and, and again, we're looking for Ephraim. We're looking for Ephraim. The ten lost tribes of Israel. We're not interested in those people that don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. Don't waste your time with them. However, the Bible says that any time that they should want to see, they shall see, and hear, they shall hear. But what we're after is to find Ephraim and to bring Ephraim together right now in the infancy of this movement. Now, in the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, the 33rd verse, it says, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm will, and with fury poured out will I rule over you. Now, that doesn't sound like a, uh, a God of all this love, love, love business, does it? He said, I will rule. He said, I will rule over you. You know, I made a statement. This thing with God is not a democracy. Okay? The only time I see us voting is God said, choose life or choose death. Okay? We get a choice, but then he went on and tried to give us the answer. He said, but choose life that both you and your seed will live. So in essence... This God that we serve looks different to us as we walk in and out of His blessing. He looks to be a God of love when we walk into the blessings. When we break the covenant, when we destroy the covenant, then it looks like He's a mean old God because then here comes the curses. So the, the key, as I said last night, is to get yourself into a position where, bless God, that you will begin to think about the covenant. I must keep the covenant. I must keep the covenant. I must keep the covenant. And by the way, the, the important thing right now for the covenant is to understand you keep Shabbat, which is Sabbath. You keep Rosh Hashanah, which is New Moon. Okay? Now please, let's don't get into this thing, well, now we keep what they keep over in Jerusalem. You ain't living in Jerusalem. Okay? You're not going to be any more holy because you decide you're going to get on the internet and do it as Jerusalem does it. New moon occurs here on a different time than it occurs over there. God said to keep new moon. He didn't say anything about going back over and being sure we do it in the motherland or ask the motherland does it. That is legalistic. Get away from it. Okay? You keep the festivals. That's going to be enough to get everybody on the right step, the right 
direction, and that's what we want you to do. So, so right now, that's where we're going to concentrate, and we're constant, going to concentrate very, very hard. Now, he goes on to say, he, after he said, he said, I'll pour, with fury poured out, will I rule over you, and I will bring you out from the people. Now, I'm going to tell you who he's talking about here. He's talking about, he's talking about Ephraim. I will bring you out from the people, and I will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered. Have we been scattered? With a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and will, with fury poured out. That's the second place that he said, with fury poured out. Now he said, I'm going to gather you, but evidently during that time when he gathers us, the fury is going to be poured out. Look at the hurricanes that have happened, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the, the fires, the floods, the storms, the pestilence. Look at what's taken place. Does that sound like fury has been poured out? Uh, I mean, the weather forecasters now are talking about the fact that there's more storms than they've ever had, and it keeps mounting year after year after year. I prophesied that these things would come and be so, come so often that they would become commonplace with people. People don't think very much. They don't think about the things that we would have thought about 20 years ago if they started talking about a tsunami or an earthquake or this or that. Today, well, oh well, you know, it's just one of those things. A bad turn of luck, I guess. Well, no, luck it doesn't have anything to do with it. 35 said, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. What is that? The wilderness of the people. We're scattered among them. We're within them. And everything seems to kind of look alike called the church. That's most agree. He said, and there will I plead with you face to face. What is he doing right now? He is pleading with you face to face. That's the reason I'm saying Ephraim will come out. Don't be worried about the rest of this thing. They're going to kick. They're going to point fingers. They're going to call us the devil. They're going to call us a cult. They're, they call us everything under the sun anyway, so they might as well keep calling. But in the midst of all that, there is no love involved. And again, I point that, that, that finger of mine at the church because you see we as ministry, and mainly the ministry of the church, no matter what, brothers and sisters, we have to love each other. It doesn't make any difference as to who's right and who's wrong. God didn't say, well, now, if they're wrong, you can hate them. Now, he didn't say that. He said, you are to love them to such a degree that you would lay your life down for them. Okay? So, so this, this scenario is now. He said, he said I, I will plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord. Now listen to this, 37. I will cause you to pass under the rod. Uh-oh. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Uh-oh. Sounds to me like he's going to do it in a pretty tough way, isn't it? How's he going to do that? These plagues. The bird flu, this thing with uh, tuberculosis, TB, the, the, these old diseases that I prophesied all those years ago that would return and we'd have no antibiotics, no way to, 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 uh, to, uh, to stop them as we thought we'd eradicated them. They'd come back. That's exactly where we're at in the midst of this thing. And God is, just as He did with Egypt, when they came out of Egypt, there was all meddling that was going on. All kind, every kind, everything you could think. The judgments all had come. Finally, Pharaoh said, go, serve your God. The church is finally going to say, go. Those of you who are Ephraim, have at it. We're going to turn loose because when all this hell breaks loose, they've got no answers. Pharaoh had no answers. He was the Pharaoh of all of Egypt, the most powerful person in the face of the earth at that time, and he could do nothing about what the living God was bringing. Okay? We and ourselves have paralleled exactly under these. And he said, he says here, he said, he said, I will cause you to pass under the rod. What's it saying? All this hell is going to come to your house. You can jump up and down. You can call out the name of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed to protect you and your family. And it ain't going to work like it never has. It's not the blood. It's the covenant. And I hope that, obviously, that we've been through that strongly enough this weekend that you can fully agree 
the fact that it is the covenant that's going to do this thing. Now he said, uh, and I love that when he said, I'm going to bring you the bond of covenant. What, what is it? Because you're, you are bonded to that covenant. You know why? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bonded to the covenant. Moses bonded to the covenant. The, the children of, Is, uh, of Israel bonded to the covenant when they said, Yea, Lord. When they covenanted with God, they bonded to God. And he said, I will bring you to the bond of the covenant. In other words, you're not going to escape it. It is set, sealed, I am the Lord thy God. As I told you, in Hebrew is the eternal seal, which means from everlasting to everlasting, or probably in better jurgen, forever and ever and ever. Now, so we look at that and we begin to realize, now look at this next verse, and I will purge out from among you the rebels, uh-oh, and them that transgress against me, I will bring forth out of the country where they so journeyed, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So what's this talking about the rest of the church? He said, I'm going to purge you out from among, what? Among you, among you the rebels. He said, I'm going to purge them out from among you. See, that's the reason with this movement, they're not going to stay. That's the reason I said, these, these people that's got all this, well, now what do you think about this, Brother Deckard? Be gone. This isn't a debate. God didn't set the covenant up to be debated. He kept the He set the covenant up to be kept. And for those who would keep the covenant, He said, "All these blessings are going to be yours if you walk in the walk in this. There, it's all there." He said, "In fact, my blessings will hunt you down and overtake you for all the days that you walk the face of this earth." But if you're not going to do that, He said, "Then you're going to get the curses over here, and and it's going to be a living hell for you and your family." all the days on the face of the earth. So we choose. But what I want you to understand here, and the thing that I have been saying for quite some time, is you've got to be able to get your eyes open spiritually and understand. Don't be going out here trying to bring a bunch of troublemakers into this thing just because, oh, we got another two or three people to take up seats. We're only looking for Ephraim. Ephraim's heart, let me one more time go through this, Ephraim's heart is set to go home. It's already there. You're not going to, you don't, uh, oh, we're going to teach. I'm teaching this weekend and I'm teaching you things of bless God that most of you have, have studied, looked at, and never, never was able to see, all right? Until you've had eyes given to you by the, by the Holy Ghost, the Raha Kadish, to be able to see, and now you can see. Well, with that, uh, there again, these people aren't going to come along and just tag along. And bless God, is God going to let people that bless God that are in rebellion, is He going to let them, let the covenant cover them? Uh-uh. Rebellion is just a sin of witchcraft, the Bible says. So if you can't agree, you disagree. If you're disagreeing, you're not disagreeing with us, you're disagreeing with God. You're disagreeing with the covenant, and now you become an enemy of God. You're a rebel. So remember these things, because I know how anxious we are to, to see this thing go forward. And, and you know, as I, I've said all weekend, I think we're growing at a, at a at, at, I think we're growing just right. I don't think we're growing too quickly until we can get the ministry up and get everybody on the same page. We could not handle many more people than we got now anyway. In fact, it'd get to be a real mess because then we're going to be out here and people, you know, wanting. I know the gals here from Kansas City said, "You got to come to Kansas City. We're coming to Kansas City. We're going to start a fellowship in Kansas City." We got people in Roanoke. We're going to do one in Roanoke. We got people down in and down in Georgia. And, and and bless God. So we the thing just keeps moving along. But you see, if we go too quickly, we're going to end up having a real problem because people's going to say, "Well, wait a minute. We don't have any leadership." And leadership's important. Somebody say, "Amen." Let's go to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Third verse, Daniel 9, 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He was serious. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, sound like he may have feared him, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to do and to them that keep his commandments. 
Now that is the strength of all this, is he went to that, didn't he? He could have said a lot of things, but again, here's what he said. He said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. What does that mercy cover? That mercy covers when we stumble. That mercy comes, bless God, uh, only when we repent. And that's important. And if you're not, and you haven't gotten that in your notes, you want to get that into the notes. The mercy of God or the mercies of God do not come into your life until repentance comes. But, and when you repent, then what happens? Then the mercy of God comes. The sin is forgiven because of Yeshua. The problem is, uh, bless God, that uh, the, the sin, but there has to be the price and even the time in which that sin has got to be paid for. All right, so you don't you don't get you just don't walk scot free away from it, and that's contrary to what a lot of the church teaches anyway. But the fact of it is, it's the truth. So he said, uh, uh, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. So we are understanding as we have walked all the way from from Genesis, and we're going to go all the way back here in just a few more verses to to the book of Malachi that this thing is throughout the Old Testament. And then, like I said, I've got about three sets of verses I want to give you in the New Testament, or what we call the New Testament, all right? Let's go to the 11th chapter of Daniel. The 11th chapter of Daniel. 11.28 Then shall he return unto his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Now, of course, we're talking about the end day scenario. We're talking about we're talking about the Antichrist, the beast, and all that that's coming out. Now, notice what he said. And and he and in his heart shall be against the holy covenant. Does Satan know how strong this covenant is? You bet he does. Do you think that there's anything in this world? that would make him tremble right now any more than for a people that has been blinded for 2,000 years all of a sudden to start seeing and understanding the strength of this holy covenant? Can you imagine? See, the reason, one of the reasons why some of you seem to be going through some hell, okay, which goes with all this, by the way, is that Satan has got to stop this thing in the infancy of it. He's got to stop it, folks. If he can't stop this thing, he knows it's over. Once we put this in place with the power and the anointing of the Rahakadish, the power and the authority of the name of Yeshua, we will become the most absolute outstanding entity that's ever walked the face of this earth in the last day. He knows that. That's the reason he's making the run at you that he's making. Whether it's with your health, whether it's with your families, whether it's the people at work. Because if he can just shake you enough to get you, and let me tell you, you want to try it out, but don't. Just walk away from this for a few months. Things will get better. This is a spiritual warfare. It's life and death. And what's going on within this at this point in time is that what God, what God wants to do is bring it forth and what Satan wants to do is destroy it. Because he knows where the strength and the power lies. It lies within the covenant. It always has. And so, an estimation of the next six or eight months is going to be crucial in this thing. It's going to be crucial. That's the reason you need to understand. Pray you one for another. Somebody call and say, hey, we're having a time. Don't just say, well, I'll pray a cute little prayer. You need, to in, you need to intercede one for another. Because the devil is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy still. We're about to give him a real black eye, and he knows that, and he's not a bit comfortable <laughs> as, uh, a bit comfortable as, as uh, we go through this thing. Now, uh, the 28th, uh, so, so he's going to come against... And, and, his heart, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. He shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Shittim 
uh, shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. There it is again. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. What's he going to do? He's going to come back and uphold that and reinforce that and talk about that. Now listen where the beginning of this is. The beginning of this are the people that are saying, oh, you don't need that anymore. You've been delivered from that. that that's the Old Testament. We're the New Testament. The old has passed away. The new has now come in. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Listen to me because I speak to you as the prophet. That is the spirit of Antichrist. The power and the strength is within the covenant. It always has been, it always will be, and it's not going to be changed. But even in the last days, he's going to come and, and, and uh, them that, the holy, that, that, that forsake the holy covenant. So are there going to be those that are forsaken? We well, yeah. And they're going to keep forsaken. They're going to keep talking against it. 31, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of the strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolation or desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. Now that uh, uh, the, the, these are small, uh, smooth words. There's going to be people going to come. There's already people. I'm already hearing how people are taking the Bible and saying, oh, look, come and look. This thing, th this is a cult. This is a, th this. Th but you know, as most of you in this room have spoken this weekend, it's always been there. Why haven't we seen it? It's so simple when you look at it the way you presented it. What's that about? Folks, it's about just exactly that. It's an, it is a spirit of Antichrist that does not want you to be able to walk in the fullness and the power of the exploits of God. And that's what it is. Is it going to get tough? It's going to, yeah, it's going to get tough. Nobody said this was going to be easy. Okay? There's nothing you're going to find out in here of where things are going to be easy. What this is, is we are bringing full turn the Holy Covenant back into our lives and we're going to keep it. And we're going to see God do just what God promised that He would do. Now, He says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. What does that mean? Well, that just means the people that know their God's keeping the covenant. Okay? The people that know their God. See, we never, as Christianity, we never looked at this thing out of the eyes of the covenant. We have looked out at this thing out of the eyes of Yeshua. And as I said, the easiest way to explain it is the fact that uh, Yeshua is just the continuation of the covenant. He never said that He come to destroy the law. He said, I come to do what? I come to complete it, fulfill it. And yet we go back and we try to make a fool out of Paul, and like I said, Paul's going to give some, some people a lot of talk when they get to heaven and get around him. Because they totally missed the boat with that thing. But what's that about? That's about speaking smooth things. Oh, come sit down here and let's talk, uh, let's talk about this thing, about what Paul had to say about this. Folks, it's time that you and the church understand something. Paul was not God. This God that we have been listening to speak throughout what I have given this weekend is the God that we serve. You know what I've always said? Who are you going to believe? God or Paul? It's that simple, isn't it? You're going to believe Paul or you're going to believe God? Paul was a piece of flesh filled with the Holy Ghost, a great man of God, as a matter of fact. But he has caused, because of his teaching, which Peter tried to tell us, you've got to watch him. He's a Pharisee and he is so smart that he will talk so far above your heads you're not going to understand most of the time what he's even got to say, and we still don't understand it. Mostly because most of us aren't Jews and we can't, we can't grasp onto and understand what the, what the whole thing was about being Pharisees back in that, a Pharisee back in that day anyway. But we have the awesome opportunity, and, I, and, and you see, and I see that, that we are at the very brink, the very doorstep, of the greatest move that there's ever been of God on the face of this earth. So explains the Scriptures to be in the last days. 
Satan's job is to steal this thing. Is he so far doing a, a good job? Yeah, he is. I don't, don't want to pat him on the back, but he's a formidable enemy at this point to us with this. Is he uh, winning? No, no, he lost. He can only at this point agitate and aggravate the situation. He can't stop it. Nor will he ever, or, or has he ever been able to stop anything. But he can slow it down. He can hinder it. But let me tell you something. When the Word of God comes, there's freedom. When truth comes, there's freedom. And we have walked into freedom. You know, we talked somewhat about this weekend, about the fact that, you know, you can't tear. Uh, once somebody has met the Lord Yeshua, you cannot tear eternal life away from those people. If they truly have met Him, you cannot tear the infillment of the Rahakadish, the Holy Ghost, away from people if they have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You cannot tear this out of people either, because it's the same God, it's the same anointing, and it's exactly the timing in which God has chosen. Not that you and I chose it, but God chose it. And to me, that's that, that that's even far more exciting than, than even probably our carnal minds can imagine. Because there really anything that we did, that was always there. I, I love it because people say, well, I've had these scriptures underlined for, I can't tell you how long, but I never saw it like that. We can't see until God lets us what? See. We can't comprehend until God lets us comprehend. And all of a sudden now, the timing is right, it all's opened up and we're going, I see. I see clearly now. Why didn't I see clearly five years ago? It wasn't time, was it? But it is now. So now, we're entering into this place, and now we're excited about it, and the devil's saying, okay boys, we've got to work overtime here. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to go with this thing day and night, 24-7, boys. Because we have got to put a stop to this. If we can't put a stop to it, we're going to have to hinder it. If we can't hinder it, we're out of business. Well, he might as well put the out of business sign out in front of the doorstep of where he lives because he's out of business. Why? You can't take this that has been indelibly inscribed in our hearts from the time that God came out of the ark, we call the ark of the covenant, and wrote his law, his laws, I'm sorry, upon the hearts of his children which was your forefathers, my forefathers. And it was passed down from generation to generation, waiting for this moment, waiting for this time, as a matter of fact. And now it's come. And here we are. Not every state in the Union, by any means, is represented here, only the states in which God's let me get to so far. But there will be every state of the Union before long. Some of you came great distances to come to listen to what God would say through this prophet. And that I appreciate. But what I would appreciate even more than that is you take home what I've taught you and you begin to teach it. You study it. You begin to, you begin to get this thing on the inside of you to such a degree that when somebody says, well, I don't know, say, well, sit down here for a few minutes and let me show you something. And if they got eyes to see, they're going to see. If they got ears to hear, they're going to hear. And as I said before, if they don't, folks, you might as well be talking to that wall over there. Do you know of anybody you have ever argued into changing their mind about anything? No. And here we are, all these generations later, still trying to debate our point of view so somebody can understand it and agree with us. No, that's not what this is about. This is about the heart. It's either there or it's not there. If it's there, it will come out. If it's not there, it can't come out, folks. So you say, we're going to have some enemies in the church. You're going to have enemies everywhere. We've always had enemies everywhere. What's the surprise about that? As I said, the Lord God put all of that Satan and all that darkness under our feet so we can go on. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. Now, of course... If you followed uh, along with me uh, 
as we did the transitioning of the church, we got into the book of the book of Hosea is written primarily about Ephraim. Okay, now in the eighth chapter, and we're just going to take a few verses here. The first verse says, "Set the trumpet to thy mouth; he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trans and, and trespassed." I'm sorry against my law. Uh oh. So he's not going to put up with that, evidently. And who's he saying is, he, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, which is talking about Ephraim. Now, on over into the 8th verse, is where he makes this statement. Israel, which is Ephraim, is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. And of course, uh, again, as we went back through that, we begin to find out that, bless God, that that was exactly what God prophesied through the old patriarch, uh, Jacob, Israel himself, and that's what they became. Uh, they became, Ephraim became the fullness of the Gentiles. Now on down into the 12th verse, he says, I have written to him the great things of my law, in an Ephraim, but they were counted as a strange thing. And you know, I love that because even today, as, as we watch this being introduced to the church, what we're, what we're hearing in all this or, or seeing in all this is that, bless God, that they're saying, oh, that doesn't pertain to us today. What is that saying to the church? It's, it's, it's a strange thing to them. See, this message that I've done this weekend is a strange thing to them. But uh, let, me, let me tell you something about prophets. We're deep into the things of God, spiritually and scripturally. And because we are, when we bring it, it can't be gainsay against. Now, they can try, but it won't uphold. Why won't it uphold? Because there, there's no way to get around the way that God brought this out of my belly this weekend to present it to you, so in turn you can present it to many others. There's no way to get around this thing, the thinking that, that, that this covenant was done away with when Jesus Christ came on this earth. Like I said, the son didn't take over the business. The father did not retire. One God, one people, and one set of rules for everybody. If not, it would be a rather confusing thing, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure would. Hey, guy, jump over there with me for a second. I love it every minute. You know, even though we, we get into this stuff, we see this stuff take place and people come against it, you know, it, it, that doesn't make me feel bad and it sure doesn't make me come, uh, hey guy, uh, we're going to do the second uh, uh, chapter. Hey guy, hey guy. Second chapter. But I, 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 and I don't feel sorry for the people that they can't see. Uh, you know, that's just the way that it is. There's always going to be sons of darkness, which is of darkness itself, sons of this world, people that are just wandering around out here that bless God that aren't ever going to come attached in any way, shape, or form to the Lord, that doesn't have it written within the hearts, passed from the generations to generations, and then there's going to be the sons of light, which we are. That, 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 and folks, that's the reason the whole world's not going to get saved. The whole world's not going to agree with us, all right? Hey, guy, the second chapter, the fifth verse. And it says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Now, now I want you to understand, he said, I covenanted with you. That's, that's what we're going to get down to, as I said this morning, when we, when we end this servant, uh, service. We're going to give you the opportunity to covenant with God. You have to make, the, make a covenant with God to receive the covenant. I, I merely went, as I went through the whole thing, if you were to buy a house, you sign a covenant, you sign an agreement, a contract. If you keep the things of the contract, everything works out well. If you don't, guess what? You lose the house. Okay? Same thing with God. You make a covenant. You have, how do you sign that covenant? Say, Lord God, I make this covenant with you to keep the things of the covenant, the things of your commandment. Just that simple. And then what have you done? You've now come into covenant with the Lord God. You now have said, I have signed the contract, so it's valid. See, it has to be valid. 
and that makes it valid, so you're now in standing to receive the blessings will overtake you and hunt you down, or hunt you down and overtake you. You're now in position to do that. That's the reason I said the sad thing about all this has been that, bless God, we've been running around here trying to believe this, trying to believe that. And, and I, again, I go back to the thing that I pounded on this weekend. The church thought the 90th, 91st Psalm belonged to them, and it didn't. It does, still doesn't. It belongs to the covenant. And I got that when I had you. No, you didn't get that when you received Jesus Christ. When you received Jesus Christ, you received eternal life. End the subject. You're saying, well, you're not making very much of eternal life. Oh, yes, I am. It's everything. We sang when we've been there 10,000 years. Huh? Yeah, it is the ticket in, folks. All right? And we've got that ticket. Don't let anybody ever try to suggest to you that Somehow, because we keep the covenant, we, we don't have the ticket for eternal life. Yes, we do. First and foremost. Amen? So he goes on to say in the sixth verse, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it was a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. He's going to fill the house with glory and power. He says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of, uh, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former house, or the former. Now, who is that? That's us. Saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So he's going to give peace in this place. So the one thing, and, and, and this question I pose to you today, after you have now come into this thing and you've received the fact that you're of Ephraim, that you are part of those ten lost tribes that were scattered all those centuries and centuries ago, the promise of God saying there would be a day when he would return and bring back and forgive the sin of Ephraim, restore us, and bring us back unto Israel. Isn't there a peace that's there? See, for the, uh, those of us that went from church to church, for those of us that couldn't seem to quite get settled with any particular thing, now all of a sudden, it's like we're settled. Well, we've always been settled. Well, no, but we are now. What is that? It's a peace. A peace that does pass all understanding. A peace that we can't even explain. A peace that says no matter whether it rains, shine, it comes up this way, that way, we belong to the Lord. We belong to His covenant. We keep His covenant. Brings peace to us. And folks, again, the thing within life itself, and I believe this, isn't money. It isn't good looks. God knows I've got both of them. <laughs> Donna said amen. Thank you, darling. At least about the good looks. We know the money thing is. But the fact of it is, it never brought the peace. Peace is what this is all about here. It's not about all that, those other things. It's not about, uh, you know, uh, I've heard people say, well, what is it that would make you happy? Oh, if I, had, if I won the lottery, that'd make me happy. No, it wouldn't. Oh, it may be for, you may be sensually happy for a while, but it would eventually go right back to the same thing it's always gone back to. Well, you know, if I had this or I had that, no, no. If you have the peace, which is the peace of Christ Himself on the inside of here, it really doesn't make any difference. Why? Because you know that you know that you know that you belong to Him. See, I, I don't know how people face the, the calamity that goes on in this world without that peace. I have watched in, in our in, uh, cousins that I have, the things that have taken place with things that they've had to face with real tragedy. And I thought, and knowing that they didn't have, didn't have any kind of peace in them, and I thought, how could you do this? How could it keep from driving you absolutely up the wall 24 hours a day? But this brings that peace. And this brings us to the place where, you know, the charismatic movement got to the place where you've got to get to the place in the Word where you just know that you know that you know that you know. You remember that old deal? That's what this has happened now. 
we know that we know that we know that we know. We may not know the end of the matter and how we're going to get there and all that, but we will. What could be anything greater than what He's done? He said, "You and all that I have done you shall do and even greater things shall you do. What could be greater than that? The latter house will only be able to answer that. You hear what I'm telling you? That's the reason I said, I think that the, the neat thing of it is, is when this thing's all over, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Isaiah and the boys are going to come up and say, sit down here and tell us about the latter house. Tell us about the glory of God that sat upon the church in that hour. And we're going to sit down there, and like I said, we're going to tell them. Amen? We're not, we're not going to be, we're not going to be backward at that part, that, at that, that part of this thing. We're going to jump in there and sit down there. We're going to tell them. And that's, and that, that's exciting. Let's go to Malachi. One scripture here, the third chapter. O says he's going to preach on, on, on trying to get her money. No, I'm not. I don't want your money. I want your prayers, okay? But I don't want your money. Now listen closely to this first verse. Behold, I will send my messenger. Who's the messenger? Yeshua. And he shall prepare a way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the, the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, what's going to take place here? The messenger of the covenant. That's who Christ is. Okay? He said, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, uh, well, that could be, the, and, and that can be translated as the Baptist coming, repent you, repent you. But it's also the fact that he is, because he goes on to say, and then, and shall suddenly come to his, in, in, uh, or to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Don't we delight in the Lord? And he is the messenger of this great, of this great covenant. But, but who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. And they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So he is going to refine us. He's going to purify us. I really think that purification now is going to be much, much simpler for us because of going back and keeping covenant with God or His covenant because I believe now we're going to have more of an understanding not only of the covenant but of His mercy. See, before, before the continuation of the covenant unto Christ coming Himself, before they had to wait one year Every year at Pesach or Passover, the lamb was killed, the blood was taken in and sprinkled upon the mercy seat for the forgiveness of, or for the sins of, of Israel. But now that Yeshua came, shed his blood, we no longer need the, the lamb to be, the, the animal to be, to be slaughtered. We now have had once and for all him to come. He now caused that old part of the covenant to pass away of that part where, where they did that. And now it's the new place that's come. Now we have access 24-7. We don't have to wait once a year. Yeshua is that which goes between us and the Father, petitioning Him with our petitions. So you see, now we, we have something that is far better. Something now that's going to be, that's going to expedite, if you will, the places when we Stumbled. Are we going to stumble? Eh, every once in a while. Unfortunately, the covenant d doesn't let anybody seemingly become perfect because as we've read this weekend, Israel did it, was blessed. Israel uh, uh, abandoned it, was cursed. And, and we're going to have those kind of problems. Except, as I said, if we, as we go back and have an opportunity, and folks, this, is, this part I think is the most unique part of all of, of what's going on with this thing with Ephraim. We have an opportunity to go back and put the right things in the right places. In other words, put our ducks all in a row. We got an opportunity to go back 
and get this thing set up. And what I tell you, the biggest corporates that go on in the church is judgment and sores of discord. Those are the two biggest corporates that kept blessings from the church. And the problem of it is, I don't want anybody to stand up and shout when I ask anybody in this room that doesn't sow or hasn't sown or isn't into having an opinion, to see having an opinion is judgment. Stand up so we can applaud you. Now I will sit down, and you can see me as sitting down and not standing up. That is the biggest culprit that we have. Now what I see in this movement is we're going to get an opportunity to go back, do this thing right, and if you don't think that isn't going to bring a flood of blessings, you watch. But see, that's not going to happen until we demand of you that it does happen. And I said to somebody this weekend, uh, I think as we uh, were there at the tables, uh, the, the way that is going to end up happening isn't going to be just the ministry, and, and it's going to be you, the people, us, the sheep. We're, going to, we're not going to let we're not going to let one uh, a goat come in and ruin all the blessings of the whole fold. We're just going to go and come and say, shut up or leave. You don't have an opinion. You're not smarter than the ministry. Leave. You want to become ministry? Put your time in. Until then, you sit here and learn like the rest of us. What does that cause? It stopped. What have we done in the past? Oh, really? Oh, I didn't. Pastor, well, you you got to be kidding. That's what we did. We become a partaker of it. And like I've, I've said and pounded on this weekend, then it became your sin too. So that, and so that in itself, that in itself kept the blessings of God from being in our homes, being in our lives. That alone never will let you be blessed. And yet we run around carrying flags, doing dances, falling on the floor, jumping straight in the air, praising God for all the blessings from, you know, for the, the way they flow into our homes and into our lives. Well, like I said, it's raining right now on the just and the unjust alike, so don't get too brazen about it. But that day has come to an end. The righteousness of God are the only ones that are going to be blessed. We're not that far from down. We're not that far from coming to that. Everybody else's lives are going to stay in turmoil. Everybody's going to live in fear of of nuclear attacks, fear of terrorism, fear of a pestilence. We're not going to live in fear of anything. We don't have to. The only thing we're going to fear is the Lord God and His covenant. That's the only thing we have to fear. Fear the Lord God and His covenant. That we and the, and again every day that you get up, you want to thank God for His holy covenant. You want to ask Him to give you the strength to see those that would come that would sow so discord, those that would come to bring judgment, and more than that, to keep your mouth shut and even your mind closed to judgment itself. Now that's not an easy task because you see here in America that's all we do. What do I like, Fox or CNN? Well, I'll tell you what, CNN's got this. Fox. What is, that's judgment. We begin as children, well, I want to watch Donald Duck. No, I want to watch, uh, you know, whoever that is over there. We start to judge everything, everything, everything. You like Coke? No, I like Pepsi. Judgment. Jud and so, now, am I, is that wrong? No, that's not wrong. But what that does is that brings us into a place and it accumulates itself into our spirit man to the place where then when it comes to the things that we don't need to be judged, and we just automatically have the opinion, oh, yeah, I've got that, blah, 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 blah. and there you go. Then sin has come. And now you're in trouble. And you want to know something? And I'm going to make this number up. I'm just going to say 99% of Christians aren't even smart enough to repent from judgment and so on a discord. They don't even think that. Well, they do it so much and everybody in the church does it and no preachers will beat the pulpits and scream and jump up and down to try to stop it that it's all part of the walk. Yep. We thought it was all part of the walk. No, it's all the part of, of an abomination which we become when those things take place. Well, now I want to share with you as we have read that, I want to jump over here and Luke, the first chapter of Luke.
Luke 69. And it says, Luke 1, 69. I might not have said 1. Luke 1, 69. And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant of David, which is the Lord. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Well, that's quite a story, isn't it? His holy prophets have been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember His holy covenant. Well, wouldn't that have been just a perfect place to say that there wasn't going to be any use for the holy covenant anymore? Well, you sure it would have been. It would have been, wouldn't it? To perform, to show, that means the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember His holy covenant. The oath which He swore to, the, to our father Abraham, that He would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. What's it again come to? The Holy Covenant. That we might remember the Holy Covenant. You know, I, I, I really, uh, again, have said this for years and years. We play this little game about the secrets of God, that He holds secret. There are things that He has in secret. There's things that He'll reveal His secrets at certain times and places through the generations, and there's some of His secrets will never be revealed until you give up the ghost. All right? But here's one of the things that I really sort of have to grin about. This God that is so powerful, omnipotent, if he is capable of all the things that he's capable of, why would he not have told us? Now please don't try to take back here to some of this stuff Paul said. Why didn't he just come out through Yeshua and just say, okay, here I am, and the Old Testament is over. As I'm always saying, the Father's now retired. I've taken over the business, and folks, we've changed the game plan. Wasn't he big enough to do that? Of course he was big enough to do that. Why would he not have done it? It was the truth. Why would this thing become such a debate? Huh? Especially when Yeshua himself said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I come to fulfill it. What is the law? It's the covenant. If he didn't come to destroy it, then bless God, what, 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 what's his law? Well, I've heard people say, well, he, 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 he completed it, so he doesn't need it anymore. No, 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 no. You can't twist it that, that way. You have to understand what's going on in this thing. Let's, let's go on over here to the, the Acts, the third chapter. One of my favorite books of the Bible. The book of Acts. The book of Acts, the third chapter, 19th verse. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto your fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto, you, unto me, him shall ye hear all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. Saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. And to you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you 
in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And that's what he came for, for our sin, okay? But again, I want you to notice what he said here as he spoke this thing. And this is Peter, okay? Again, you know, I, as I said, isn't it a shame that we didn't have the writings of Peter since he was given the keys to the kingdom? Now, the prophets was important. But he said, the covenant which was made with our fathers. So again, wouldn't that have been a perfect place to say the covenant was made with our fathers? And Peter said, yeah, but now that Jesus has come, we don't have that covenant anymore. The only covenant we have is the covenant to get to heaven. Now listen, I said something, and I said something prophetic, and I want you to get a hold of it. Because that's really what the church is saying. The only covenant that we need now is the covenant to get us to heaven. Well, what about living here on this earth until we get to heaven? See, that's what the covenant is about. The covenant is about us being blessed while we're still here, here on this earth. That portion of the covenant, which includes Messiah, Yeshua, that is the ticket to heaven. Okay? But really what the church is saying, you don't, you don't need the covenant here to be blessed on this earth. Just live, live in the hell that you're living in. Pretend that all that's yours because it's not working. See, that's the indictment that I made for years against the church. It doesn't work. If it works, show it to me. Paul talked about the demonstration of spirit and, and, and bless God, a, a, a power. We don't see that. It's not there. What did we have here last night in this room? We had a demonstration of the power and the spirit of Almighty God by His anointing. And nobody that was here can dispute that, can you? But yet somehow, we traded all that. And like I said, the neat thing about it, God's bringing it all back again. Some of you will demonstrate the power, the anointing of His Spirit. Boy, what a time. Let's go to Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans eleven twenty six. And to all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, Christ Himself, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And what I wanted there was for you to understand that that is the continuation. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. It's my covenant. It's just part of all the rest of what he did and he said. But there again, nowhere, nowhere is he saying that we no longer need. Now let me ask you a question. And this is going to reverse everything that we've ever, way of thinking we've ever had with the church. The church says, why would you want the Old Testament? Now I'm going to ask you, why wouldn't you want the covenant? The blessings are all contained there. We went through and we read all this stuff. Why wouldn't we want that? The church told us we didn't need it. But was the church right? No, the church wasn't right. The church couldn't have been right. If the church was right, bless God, the 91st Psalm would still be working over here on this side that says, well, we don't, we don't want that. But now listen to what the church is saying. But all the blessings are ours. Are all the blessings ours? Uh-uh. No, they're not. And that's what is important. Why wouldn't we want to be blessed? On the conquest that I've had over these 20 years, probably kind of closer to 21 now, has been, I'm sorry, 25 years, has been that bless God, Somewhere we missed the mark. That thing that went in into all of us of not being able to become peaceful, being in the churches that we were in and around the ministries that we were around. I went at it about the place of beginning to question and beginning to say, well, if the blessings are there, show them to me. 
show them, show them to me. I, I, I really, I need, see, I need to know. As a Jew, I need to know that I don't have to worry about that over there anymore. But the fact of it is, you do have to worry about that over there anymore. You keep the covenant, you're blessed. You break the covenant, you're cursed. And all we all can figure out the 91st Psalm doesn't work just because you become a Christian. See, again, you want to talk about a fantasy world, you want to talk about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Receive Jesus Christ. And all this will be yours. What? Isn't that what the devil told Christ himself when he was there after 40 days of work? He said, I will give you all these kingdoms if you'll bow down and serve me. What did he say? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of who? Not him, but God. And he said, I'm not greater than my Father. And yet, as I said, we go into services and you never hear the Father's name mentioned. It's always the Son. I am the Lord thy God. I am the I am's of the I am's. And Yeshua said, I come. He said, I don't have anything to say to you except that which the Father has said to me. His doctrine is my doctrine. His covenant is my covenant. And yet somehow we in the church got this thing all monkeyed up. And then we got into this thing of bless God thinking that, you know, well, that, yeah, there's no sense getting into that because you know why I think that really happened? I think that really happened because if they're going to get back into the prophets, but now, uh, they only did that when it was convenient. Now, if, if you were never going to ever use what they call the Old Testament, why, if you don't believe in that, why would you go back there and preach on those things of the prophets? Why would you do that? Why did you not do like a certain, I think well, at least one sect that I'm thinking of Christianity, they just, they just, flat, they, their Bible only was what was called the New Testament. From Matthew back through, uh, through, uh, 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 Revelation. I think maybe they had, I think they, they did put Psalms in some of, some of them. But what was that about? Was it a shortcut? I, well, it, it sounds easier. Jesus come into my heart, the 91st Psalm, all this other stuff's mine. I got a Jewish prophet over here, so I must got all that Jewish junk back on the other side. Since it's all, you know, it's all passed away because it's the old stuff, and I'm over here on the new side with all the new stuff. I mean, you never heard anybody say, no, 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 no. That was only the continuation of the covenant. Most of you in this room have never heard that sentence used before this weekend. That is all that that was, which is everything for eternal life with Christ, as I keep saying. But the key and the understanding of the key is that it was started there and it kept coming all the way through and it is going to end with him coming back again. Now when he comes back again, is in fact, is he going to implement uh, during the millennium reign? Is he just going to be, well, if you got me, then all you got to do is nothing else. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing you're going to have to do among numbers of others. You are going to keep the festivals. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't, if you're not going to keep, if you're not going to keep the one that he mentions, then bless God, uh, it's going to do what? It's not, there's going to be rain come on your land. Well, now wait a minute. If wait, if we've been delivered out of all that stuff, why in the world is he going to come back and stick that in our ear? Come on, folks. I'm giving you, I'm giving you some food for thought here. Get it. Why? So you understand, it never quit. Folks, there's too many trails lead back to the covenant for us to be so stupid and so foolish to think that because it's not the idea of the church, there's too many pinnacles that reach back to the holy covenant, the everlasting covenant. You can't deny what's been taught. I haven't twisted scriptures, I read scriptures. I haven't read it and said, well, no, this isn't what that really means, what this really means. No, no, no. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Now you have the truth. Now you know what, what we end with today? What are you going to do with the truth? You're going to take it home and hide it away over here? Put it on a hill and put a basket over it? Or are you going to take it off and let it shine? 
I hope that you'll let this thing shine. Because Ephraim is there. This will prick the heart of Ephraim. And Ephraim will stand up and applaud. Now listen to me. The rest of them will argue. The rest of them will want to debate. And the rest of them will call you a cult. Never mind them. And look, look, not, look not back over your shoulder. Have no regrets. For yea, your time has come. The light has shined upon you. Thank God that it shined. Don't kick against the pricks, as the Lord God said. Bring yourself full turn and stand up and be proud to be counted as those of the covenant. If it was good enough for Moses, it's good enough for you. Eh? Good enough for me. You notice how I got that A in there? Those can, hey, A. <laughs> I'm warming up. We're going up to Canada next week. I want to make sure, you know, hop on the binders, eh? <laughs> We're turning right up here. They know I love them. If you haven't got to know them, get to know them. They're good folks. Well, we've come to that time. We've come to the decision time, the point of all of what this thing has been about all weekend. Very simply, in order to have had it, in order to have had it, they had to do what? They had to covenant to it. It said, and they covenant with the Lord God. They made the agreement to agree. Signed the contract by saying yea. And that's the opportunity we want to give you. And as I said, I don't really think there's... A, you, know, I, I, you know, we went through, you need to understand, you break the covenant, the curses are going to come. What's the difference? You're walking in curses anyway. Right? So that's not too tough to figure out, is it? So what I want to do, if you want to participate, in a few moments I'm going to have everybody to stand that wants to covenant to God. And we together in this room, hand, I'm going to ask everybody to, to hold hands. So the aisles will need to come together. I'll come down. Donna will come down. And we together are going to hold hands and we, as this group, of those of you that want to, are going to covenant. We're going to make a covenant with our God saying, yes, we agree with His covenant. And we're going to uphold His covenant the days of our life. We're going to teach our children and our children's children the covenant of the Lord God that was given to Abraham, given to Isaac, given to Jacob, brought forth by, uh, by Moses through the writing upon tablets by the finger of God Himself. That we're going to do. And if you don't feel you can participate, no, don't, don't feel bad about it. That's fine. As again, I don't, I don't see any minuses to it. I, I, you know, I think that you need to understand that you need to do it with fear, but that fear will make you every day go back and say, Lord, help me to keep the covenant. Help me. Show me. If you begin to pray and say, God, show me where I'm outside the covenant, you'll be surprised. You want to talk about hearing from God, you're going to be surprised at some of the things that God's going to begin to open up and show you as to what you can do to strengthen yourself within the covenant. And as time goes on, we'll present more and more of the things that God would, would want to drop into your bucket about the covenant, but I think that you have a, have a real, real good uh, start, okay? In fact, I know you do with the covenant. And this thing from this point is only going to do this, go up. Believe me, don't, don't think it's just going to all go to uh, dingy-looking brown and head the other. No, it's not. Like I said, we've been there. We're there now. You've got nothing to lose. You've got everything to gain. For those of you that can enter into this covenant, we want you to stand to your feet. We want you to stand. Everybody hold hands. Just step out into the aisles and the areas of this aisle. That's it. Uh, stand up. I want you to now, I want you to now to bow your heads. If you, if you have coverings, cover your heads. We're facing the east under Jerusalem, Baruch Hashem. I want you just to begin to, inside of your heart, inside of your minds, begin to see Him as He hung upon that tree, as He bore those stripes, as that crown of thorns was driven down into His head, and the spear was driven through His, his side that He came to fulfill what the law couldn't do for us. 
and our Father continued the covenant and said, I will not leave you forsaken, but I will make provision for you in every area of your life throughout the generations, for I am the Lord thy God. I want you to repeat now after me. Father, Father, I covenant with you to your covenant. I understand the covenant and I receive it. I know that there are blessings and cursings and I will keep the covenant So me and all of mine will be blessed all the days of our life. And it will be given unto my children and even unto my children's children. And I will stand in that holy place and I will proclaim you as the Almighty God that you are. Teach us. Draw us. Lead us and bring us to the bond of the covenant that we might understand. As generation and generation have not understood, our eyes are now open and we see our light has come. Thank you, Lord. And Satan, you're a liar. You're the father of all lies will not receive condemnation. Will not receive those coming to us trying to steal the covenant from us. For we are the children of the end. We are the house of Ephraim. And we shall come home. We do this all through the name of your Holy Son. We sign the contract. We sign the covenant. We make the agreement in the name of Yeshua. And everybody shouted, Amen! Amen. Put your hands together and glorify Him. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Blessed is His holy name. Blessed! Blessed is His holy name. Woo! Blessed is His holy name. Blessed is His holy name. (laughs) Do, Do you remember how happy you were when you signed the contract to that first home or maybe the home you have now, you remember how you walked out of that place and you just, there's kind of a, kind of a gip in your sex, wasn't it? Well, there's kind of a gip in our step today. We are the first fruits. We are. He's our God. And He will honor the covenant all the days of your life and my life. It's ours. You have hold of it. Don't you turn loose. It's yours. And nobody else has a right unless they have covenant to the Lord God. They can't take it away from you. You can give it away and you can break it. But nobody can take that from you. Why? You just signed the agreement. Hmm? You've signed it. That baby now is yours. Mine in the bank, yours and God. 
right? Remember how we used to say, well, that's my house? No, that's my house and the bank's house. This is your covenant? Yes. He owns it though still. Thank God he does because he'll watch over it, amen? I feel good. I feel good about this weekend. I feel good about you. I, there, was a, there was a breaking that happened here last night with that deliverance. There was a real breaking that happened with that deliverance. And I'm going to tell you something. That's what this is all about. It's God meeting the needs of His people. That's what it is. The shadow of a prophet like me being able to produce this kind of anointing to destroy the yoke. Listen to me. Was God trying to say to the church, this is the covenant. That's what He was really trying to say through the prophet. This is the covenant. Examine your hearts. And they never examined them, did they? Thank God. Be seated for a moment. Well, you know, the flood couldn't drown it, the fire couldn't burn it. Because he's God. And there's not hail or wind or storm, flood, snowstorms or anything else. He, the summer, is going to keep us from being together. And I, as I said, I sensed Friday night a bonding. I hadn't sensed that. I thought, well, things were working well. We, we seemed to people get along well. But I sensed a bonding this weekend. And that bonding will stay in place. Don't let the devil steal the bonding. Don't let that happen. Why? Because we're all in this thing together. We can't make it on our own. We have to have each other. There's no any, any bless God, great big me's. There's a whole bunch of little eyes. Okay? And that's all of us.